Okay, it's Sunday morning. Maybe you don't have a church to go to. Maybe you aren't in church right now. Maybe you can't find a Bible-believing church. So I wanted to do a few videos on Sunday for these people that don't have a place to go. And I wanted to do something like a, a Sunday school lesson and then two more lessons. So it's like you can have church online. And I know a lot of people are against that, but you got to do what you got to do. But in this study, I wanted to talk about Genesis, the end times pictures in Genesis. Because I see a lot of it in Genesis, the end times, how the end times are pictured in Genesis. And just to give you a quick outline of what the book of Genesis is about, in the first two chapters you have the creation. In chapter 3 you have the fall of man. Chapter 4 shows you Cain and Abel. In chapter 5 you got the generations of Adam. Chapter 6 you got Noah and the flood. Chapter 10 you got the generations of Noah. Chapter 11, Tower of Babel. 12 through 25 you have the life stories of Abraham and Isaac. 26 through 27, you see Jacob and Esau. 28 through 35 shows you the life of Jacob. 36 gives you the generations of Esau. And 37 through 50, you have the life of Joseph. That's a good portion of what Genesis is about. There's those stories there. And the book has 50 chapters, 1,534 verses, and 38,262 words. The author is Moses. Even though Moses wasn't alive during the events of Genesis, God easily told him what to write down, and Moses wrote Genesis through Deuteronomy. And, in, and Genesis is also called the first book of Moses or the book of beginnings. But the time period would be 4,004 B.C. to 1570. BC. But now let's look at the end times events that are pictured in the book of Genesis. And the first one I want to talk about is the Lord set a mark upon Cain. If you look at Genesis 4:14, 4, it says, "Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth." This is Cain talking. And from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So Cain has just killed Abel. And you see, the death penalty hasn't been established yet. And he's worried that who somebody's going to find him and kill him since he killed his brother Abel. So the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now, this picture is something that's coming in the future. The Antichrist counterfeits this with his own mark. If you don't worship the Antichrist and receive the mark, you will be killed. In Revelation 13, 15 through 18... It says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So just like the Lord set a mark upon Cain so that he wouldn't be killed, the Antichrist has men put a mark on them so that they won't be killed. It's the devil's counterfeit. In 1 John 3, 12, it says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. The Antichrist is called the wicked one. Cain is a type of the Antichrist. There's a lot of similarities here. The end times events that you read in Revelation are pictured in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Now, here's another one, the rapture of the church. Very popular one. If you're familiar with the Bible, 
a lot of these are just common sense. But I have a lot of viewers who are new to the Bible. I get new listeners every single day that have no idea about my past videos. They have no idea about anything about the Bible. So that's why I repeat myself a lot. But the, the rapture of the church is also pictured in the book of Genesis. In Genesis five twenty three and 24. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and 5 years. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not. For God took him. Hebrews eleven five By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. But before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. So that pictures the rapture of the church. Enoch pictures Christians who were caught out alive at the rapture without dying. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17 talks about our rapture. And it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. They're going to get up out of their graves. And then we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them and the Lord in the clouds. And so we'll ever be with the Lord. We're going to be translated in, in the sense just like Enoch was in that sense. Going straight up to the third heaven. Enoch walked the earth 365 days. A Christian should walk with God Excuse me, Enoch walked the earth 365 years. And a Christian should walk with God 365 days out of the year. You may not live 365 years, but if you live 365 days in the year, it ought to be giving glory to God, acknowledging God every day. Enoch is translated by God before the flood comes just like we're raptured out before the tribulation. Enoch has a son named Methuselah, who lives to be 969 years, and Methuselah's name means when he is dead, it shall be sent, referring to the flood. And also, in the book of Genesis, you have people living long lifespans. And this picture is something in the millennium. So you have Methuselah living to be 969 years, Noah living to be 950 years, and Adam lived to be 900 and something years old. All these people, especially in Genesis 5, telling you how long these people live, very interesting. In Isaiah 65, 20, it says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days, for the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. So when you get to the millennium, it's going to be considered young to die a hundred years old. You're going, they're going to be considered it like a child dying. It goes back to pre-flood ages. And if the long lifespans back in Genesis applied to the animals as well, then this could be where you have dinosaurs. This could be where you have uh, dinosaurs showing up because reptiles grow as long as they live. That could be where that comes into play. But Enoch shows us the rapture of the church. Next, you have the days of Noah. In Genesis chapter 6 through 9, you have the story of Noah and in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, Jesus said, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. When Noah built the ark, it hadn't ever rained before. That's something significant. Imagine being someone who didn't get on the ark and then all of a sudden water starts coming from the sky. It's not just a little bit of water like you see. It was a lot of water. But in Genesis 
2, 5 through 6, it says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground, but there went up a mist from the earth, and watered the whole face of the ground. So a mist came up to water the whole face of the ground back then. But when the flood came, it starts raining. So a storm was something the world hadn't ever seen. Just like the tribulation will be unlike anything man has ever seen. In Matthew twenty four twenty one, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time known or ever shall be. So in Genesis you have the days of Noah. What does Jesus say the end times will be like? As it were in the days of Noah. The end times are pictured in Genesis. What were the days of Noah like? Well, in Genesis 6, 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis six eleven: The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Noah and his family picture the Jewish remnant being preserved through the tribulation as they're preserved through the flood. And next, an end time event that's pictured in Genesis is a one world government. In Genesis 10, 8 through 9, you have a guy showing up by the name of Nimrod. It says, And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. So this Nimrod, king of Babylon, he pictures the Antichrist. His name means rebel. And what is the Antichrist? He's a rebel. Nimrod is the 13th from Adam. The number 13 in the Bible is the number of rebellion. And the Antichrist is associated with the number 13. Read Revelation 13. So Nimrod is king of Babylon. It says in Genesis 10.10, 10, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. The Antichrist is associated with Babylon. Revelation 17.3 shows you that. Nimrod wants to make a name for himself. It says in Genesis 11.1, 1, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. In verse 4 in chapter 11 it says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth, go to, let us go down. This is now the Lord's talking. He says, go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So all these people were getting together in an ecumenical movement, everybody getting together despite any differences they have to make a one world government to uh, go against God and to build this tower to reach into heaven. Now, this is to reach to the second heaven. But what does the devil want to do? He wanted to set his throne above the stars of God. He wanted to reach the third heaven. So you got to watch that all this wanting to get up higher, wanting to make a name for yourself. The Antichrist wants a name above every name. He wants to make a name. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what the Antichrist is going to do in the middle of the tribulation. The people back in Genesis 11, the people were gathering together against God instead of spreading out and populating the world. In the tribulation, men will gather together against God under the world system of the Antichrist. There will be a one-world government, a one-world currency, one way to, to buy and sell, as it talks about in Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, 7 and 8, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So you have the one world government. 
a one world government. Showing up in Genesis 11, you have a one world government in the tribulation. The end times events are pictured in Genesis. Next, God gives Abraham an everlasting covenant of a promised seed and land. And this will be given to Israel in the future time period, the millennium. In Genesis 15, 5 through 7, it says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. It says in Genesis fifteen eighteen, the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt into the great river, the river Euphrates. So God promises Abraham a, a seed. He tells him to look up toward heaven, and if you can count those stars that are innumerable, that's how many kids you're going to have. And he tells him, I'm giving you all this land. I'm giving you this land grant. And see, this, these things aren't just, this, God's not kidding around. The promises come to pass. Abraham ends up having Isaac, the promised child. And Isaac has Jacob. And Jacob begets Joseph and the, all the 12, the 12 sons that make up the 12 tribes of Israel. And God's not done with Israel. In the millennium, the Jews are going to get their land. They're going to dwell in their land in safety. They're going to lie down and none's going to make them afraid. And people are finally going to see that God didn't lie. And, and they're going to see that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. But you have this talk talked about all the way back in Genesis. Something that's going to be fulfilled in the millennium and throughout eternity. Next, you got the days of Lot. Not only is the tribulation called the days of, like the days of Noah, but it's also like the days of Lot. In Luke 17, 28 through 30, it says, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What happened in the days of Lot? Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah. A wicked place, extremely wicked. You had angels showing up, doing things to people. Just like you read Revelation, you got angels showing up, playing a part, a big part in things again in the world. What else happened? You had fire and brimstone coming down on Sodom. What happens in the tribulation? You got all kinds of things coming down out of the sky. Hell and fire mingled with blood coming down on people during the tribulation. It's going to be a lot more than cloudy with the chance of meatballs. That's what it's going to be like. The days of Lot. When, the, when Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, he's going to be raining fire on people. And flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's another thing? Jacob's trouble. You know, we call it the tribulation, but that second half of that future horrible time period is called the time of Jacob's trouble. I believe the whole seven years is God going back to dealing with Israel. And at least the last half is called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, son of Abraham, Abraham beget Isaac, Isaac beget Jacob. Jacob had his name changed to Israel. And that's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why they're called the children of Israel. Because it's, it, it, Jacob got his name changed to Israel. From him came the 12 tribes. And that's where you get the children of Israel. And in the tribulation, God goes back to dealing with the nation of Israel. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Abraham begets Isaac, and Isaac begets Jacob. Jacob beget 12 sons, which made the 12 tribes of Israel. The Lord changed Jacob's name to Israel. The Jews come from those 12 sons, and this is why you call them the children of Israel. 
that's that's a key to get down. But the tribulation, this is key. God goes back to dealing with Israel. And this is why you have it called the time of Jacob's trouble. Not the church's trouble. But you know, Jacob's sons trick him into thinking that his son Joseph has, has died. And Joseph, Joseph is one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in the Bible. In Genesis thirty-seven thirty-one, it says, And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood so that they can bring it and show it to Joseph and say, Hey, he's, he's dead. When Jesus comes back at the second coming, he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. So just like Joseph had his coat dipped in blood, Jesus Christ comes back with his vesture dipped in blood. In Genesis 37, 32 through 35, it says, And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father, Jacob, and said, This have we found. Know, know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. There's an evil beast that shows up in the tribulation. The beast, the Antichrist. And he says, Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all, and all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. This is Jacob, who is Israel. And this pictures the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is mourning over his son Joseph, who is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in the future time period, called the time of Jacob's trouble, they are going to mourn, just like Jacob, when they realize they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. In Zechariah 12.10, it says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Notice that. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So the same way, Jacob is mourning over how he thought Joseph had died. Israel is going to mourn when they find out they crucified their Messiah in that future tribulation time period. Now next you got seven years of famine that show up. You know, Joseph, he's sold into Egypt. He becomes second ruler in the kingdom under Pharaoh. Joseph, a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream about seven years of famine. And Joseph is made second in the kingdom. But he says in uh, Genesis 41, 29 through 30, Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt. And the famine shall consume the land. So Joseph's brothers, who previously rejected him, must come to Joseph to survive the famine. You know, it was it was the Joseph's brothers, they were jealous because Jacob loved Israel or, or excuse me, Jacob loved Joseph more than them. They were jealous. They almost kill him, but eventually just they put him, you know, they put him in that pit where there's no water, and then they end up getting him out and selling him off, and he ends up in Egypt. And this pictures the Jews who previously rejected Jesus at his first coming. But then they have to get go to Jesus during the tribulation, a time of famine. So when Jesus came the first time, he came into his own and his own received him not. But in that future coming time period, they're going to believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he was. They're going to bow down. Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. Just like how Joseph's brothers, at first they rejected him. But when that famine comes, a time of famine comes, they go to him to get food. Just like in the tribulation, 
They may have been cross rejectors before, but in the tribulation, Jesus cross warns himself to the disciples. It's going to be a time of famines. And you can read about that in Matthew 24, Luke 21. It's going to be the worst time the world has ever seen. People who rejected Jesus Christ the first time, they're going to turn to him the second time to get food. Now, the next thing, the phrase, until Shiloh come. You ever been reading Genesis? And it says in Genesis 49, 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And to him shall the gathering of the people be. Shiloh means peace bringer. Who's the peace bringer? Jesus Christ is. Unto us a son is unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There is no peace until the Prince of Peace shows up. And that Prince of Peace is the lion of the tribe of Judah. You need to learn about these tribes. Most Christians don't even know what the 12 tribes are. But like I said, these 12 tribes came from Jacob. And one of Jacob's sons is Judah. And Jesus is of the line of the tribe of Judah. You see, a lot of people don't like these genealogies that show up. But I mean, you need to at least learn Abraham beget Isaac, and Isaac beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Judah. And Judah is, he's the lawgiver. The, Jesus Christ is the lawgiver. He's from the line. He, he's from Judah. He's the line of the tribe of Judah. And in Genesis forty nine eleven, it says, "Binding his foal into the vine, and his asses called into the choice vine. He washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in a blood of grapes." What does that remind you of? Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming, when he stomps people under his white horse. Like it's grapes. In Revelation fourteen twenty, it says, And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. He's coming out of the sky, he's busting the sky open and comes down and squashes people like they're a bunch of grapes. And in Genesis, all the way back in Genesis forty nine eleven it talks about until Shiloh come, and then it says, and his clothes, and he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Wine in the Bible is a type of blood, and it says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Jesus Christ in Revelation 5.5 5 is the lion of the tribe of Judah. In Isaiah 63, 1 through 6, it describes this same event perfectly. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the winefat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me, and I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. All the way back... In Genesis 49, you have a prophecy of the second coming that's described in Revelation, that's described in Isaiah 63. The Bible is an amazing book. Genesis not only shows you the beginning, it's the book of beginnings, but it also shows you the ending. I mean, if you learn the book of Genesis and learn all the types and pictures in the book of Genesis, 
you you just about learned about everything in the Bible. Genesis is an amazing book, but I, I'm putting this on here Sunday morning. Maybe you can't get up and go to church. Here's your Sunday school lesson. And I hope this will get you interested in the Bible. I hope this makes you want to read the book of Genesis. I hope this makes you want to study the end times. And I got plenty of end times videos. Just go back on my channel, click videos, and just... I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos. I mean, you could stay busy all week. Maybe you can't get out. Maybe you're stuck in your house. You can't get out. Watch the videos. Keep your mind on the Word of God. You can visit the website. I have a bunch of audio on there you can listen to. Plenty of stuff to read on there. HensleyBibleBeliever.com If you want to go there, check out the audio studies and the written lessons.